Good evening, all. Um, it's not, uh, so I was going to say it's 9.30. If it's 9.30, I should be in bed. Um, it's 7.30 um, and time to begin. Uh, it, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jason Askew. Uh, I am the Training and Development Officer for the National Synod of Wales. And uh, for the last eight weeks, and hopefully going forward. Um, somebody said a song. And it just so happens that I came across a song yesterday uh, that goes to the to a hymn uh, or a song for worship. Uh, it goes to the tune, if you can get it in your head, of Three Blind Mice. You know that classical tune, Three Blind Mice, Three Blind Mice, see how they run. Uh, I'm not going to sing it, but it goes zoom, 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 zoom. God's in the room, God's in the room. We may be scattered out home by home, and some of us may even live alone, but God will gather us all into one by zoom, zoom, zoom. <laughs> zoom, 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 God's in the room. <laughs> Don't just assume that only those who can get on screen are reached by the God who loves us unseen. Let's pray for all as we now join and sing by zoom, zoom, zoom. <laughs> Last, oh, it's not last verse. Hang on. Zoom, 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 zoom. <laughs> God's in the room. Work in the loom. Yes, God is here as we try to share, to weave us together in mutual care, to make us strong for the problems out there. So boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. God's in the room. God's in the room. We may be scattered out home by home, and some of us spend every day alone, but God keeps care of us all one by one so boom boom <laughs> yeah. touch of black out of there <laughs> that's before we get into the the fun and the excitement of risk assessments um for those of you who don't know why you're here that's why you're here um risk assessments in this crazy time uh, thinking about reopening what we have to do uh, and specifically tonight um, but, but this will help going forward, reopening uh, for private prayer. Um, things have moved fast uh, and, and we will be, you know, th these things will be applicable as churches continue to open wider and wider. Um, so for those of you who don't know why you're here, it is about risk assessments, it is about opening. Um, before we dive into uh, risk assessments, I just want to talk about Zoom uh, and how we're going to use it tonight. Um, some of you, I gather, already are experts at this, and uh, but I'm just going to kind of go through how we um, how we work it. Before I do that, just to say that you should have some documents. Uh, you should have this. We'll see that. Uh, you should have a copy of this. This is uh, the outline of how it will go. So uh, I'm going to welcome and, and introduce um, Zoom and uh, and then move into um, the flowchart. We're going to work through the flowchart. Simon's then going to take us through uh, the volunteer uh, personal risk assessment. Uh, Chris is going to take us through buildings risk assessment and documents to Synod. Judy is going to take us through prayer ideas and then we'll have a time for questions. If you do have any questions as we go along, please don't hesitate to uh, raise your hand. I'm going to show you how to raise your hand in a minute. Now you may think that you just lift it up like that but a virtual hand is better, okay? Um, so, somewhere here, I have a PowerPoint. Da, da, da. That's better. Okay, look. Using Zoom tonight, um, the, uh, the first thing to note is to raise a hand. Um, if you go, if, if you're on a, a laptop, you go to the bottom or wherever it is on your screen, uh, to participants. It could be in the top right, the top left, or down the bottom, uh, depending on whether you've got an iPad or a, a, a telephone. If you've got a video phone, uh, it will be similar to here. Um, but you'll find that participants. And then you look for either it says raise hand in the box that pops up, or you click the three dots and it says raise hand there. If you raise a hand, then um, I can see that and everyone else can see that, that you want to speak. Um, 
to, to get to lower your hand again, you go back to the same place, click it again, and it lowers the hand. Um, so I hope you all got that. The next thing is, um, you, you, if you want to ask a question, you can either raise your hand, as I've just said, or you can click on the chat box. If you see down the bottom of the screen, it says chat. Um, if you click on the chat box, uh, a box opens up in front of your face uh, and you can type in where it says type message here, you can type in your question or comment. Okay. Um, if you want to, you can drag that box to one side so that you can still see people who are speaking uh, or yourself. The next thing which we've already talked about for those of you who are on a bit earlier is uh, speaker view or gallery view. Speaker view is where is, is good for when one person's talking like at the moment, if you've just got speaker view, uh, you can just see my screen uh, or, or me. Uh, when we go into question time later on, you may want to, to go into gallery view and all you do is simply click where it says speaker view and click on gallery view. Um, and then vice versa when you want to go back. Um, if you're having trouble with your internet connection, uh, there's a couple of things you can do. You can go to the bit where it's where, where the video camera is. You, on, on a laptop, it will be down the left. Um, again, it could be up the top. Um, different people seem to have different places. iPads are different to tablets. Um, but, but you'll find that, that video uh, button. If you stop video, we can still hear you and you can still hear us just like we did with Marjorie earlier. Um, we couldn't see her, but we could hear her and she could hear us. Um, but that actually uses less bandwidth and, uh, and enables your internet to work better if it's playing up. You can also click the mute button, which is next to that, and, uh, and that too will help. Uh, as you're all muted at the moment, um, that helps. It also helps um, for the, the golden rule, uh, don't talk over other people. Um, and so having the, the mute button is helpful. If you want to unmute yourself, you just click the mute button, or if you're on a laptop, you can hold down the space bar and talk. And when you let go of the space bar, it mutes you again. Um, one more thing is we will have a, a short break in the, the, the middle uh, of the session. Uh, it will only be about a two minute break just to stand up, turn around and sit down again um, and, and have a little wriggle. Has anyone got any questions about Zoom? Not about everything in the whole wide world, but just about Zoom and using it. Is everybody happy? Can everybody put the thumb up if they're happy? Jason, Margaret Craig has her hand up. Yeah. Does she? I can't see that. Yeah. Margaret, did you have a question? No. No, okay. You were just practicing. I was practicing. Excellent. Uh, Okie doke. I want to move on now to the flow chart. Um, I take it you've all been given a copy of the flow chart. Uh, and this flow chart will guide you through the process. Uh, as I said later on, um, Simon will talk about the, the risk assessment for personal use, and uh, the, uh, Chris will talk about the building's risk assessment. But this is to guide you through the whole process. Um, I'm going to share it on screen, so um, if you've got the, the copy, you can see that, but, but if you look at the screen in a minute, you'll see the bit that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, share screen. Get that. There we go. A um, couple of things before we get straight into the, uh, the, the flow jar is one, uh, it's an obvious thing, but it's a bit of a thing on my shoulder that I'm going to get off. And that is, uh, this is not an exercise in, in how to fill out a form. Uh, this is an exercise in staying safe and keeping other people safe um, during this pandemic and uh, the responsibility that we have to do that, uh, both to ourselves, to other people and to our insurance companies. No doubt Chris will mention that later on. Um, if at any stage during the flowchart, as you're moving through, you cannot do 
uh, what's requested in the box. You cannot carry out the, the what, what it says in the box. Then you don't move to the next box. That's as far as you can go. Um, and the exception to that rule is the second to last box, um, which we are all aiming for. It's the most important box on the flowchart, and that is to pray. Um, indeed, it's so important. I think we should stop for a moment already and just offer ourselves to God in prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for your blessings in our lives. We thank you for the, the church gathered wherever it can, in a field, in a building, in Zoom. And while this might seem a, a merely practical matter, it's also a matter of, of church life, of gathering together and worshipping you, something that we long to do and we've not done for a while. And it may be a while before we can do it again. But Lord, we ask as we consider these matters tonight, your Holy Spirit would guide us, guard us and protect us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's get going. You start at the start box, that's fairly obvious. And the first thing that you need to do is to consult as elders meeting on behalf of the church meeting, um, minister and elders, uh, either via Zoom, Skype, telephone, uh, however you can consult one another uh, as an elders meeting, do that with the, the single question that you're asking is in that diamond box. Do we want to reopen our building now at this time? And the answer is obviously yes or no. Um, if the answer is no, that's not a defeat. It's not that you've failed. Uh, and I want to make this absolutely clear. It's not that, that, that you, you know, you failed as a church or anything like that. The answer is no. And you follow that line round down and to the box about thinking about ways of prayer, which Judy is going to talk to us later on about, um, and, and to the box to pray. Uh, so all it means is you're going to go a different route as a church down to, to the pray box. It doesn't mean you, you failed, you were just taking a different route. Um, if, however, you decide that you want to reopen uh, at this time, then the answer is yes, and you move down and inform Synod of your intention. Um, I should just say that you were given some notes with the flowchart. Um, those notes uh, will guide you through um, the detail of the flowchart. So at this point, uh, to inform Synod, you, you just need to let um, Synod know probably best via Chris Atherton. Um, and uh, you don't need to wait for an answer for that. You can carry on down to the next box, which is to carry out the volunteer workforce risk assessment, or otherwise known as the personal risk assessment. And uh, so all your volunteers who might staff the church, steward the church, uh, need to, to be guided through uh, this risk assessment, this personal risk assessment. And then when everybody's done it, you then have to ask the question, do we have sufficient low risk volunteers? There's green boxes, uh, yellow boxes, orange boxes, red boxes. Everybody needs to be green or at least enough people for you to reopen uh, and do all the jobs and, and tasks that you need to do uh, to be reopened. Again, if the answer is no, then simply go to the right where it says no and follow the box down to a different way of prayer. You've not failed, it's just a different way. If the answer is yes, you've got enough people to staff uh, the, the building and to clean, etc., then you can move on to carrying out the, the building's risk assessment. Chris is going to talk to us about that uh, in a little while. Um, the question you ask at this point is, are all areas of risk at an acceptable level? That means, are they all green? If the answer is no, you go to the right to the next question, which is, can you mitigate the risk? Can you cancel out that risk? Can you do something that, that you know, uh, if, if I, there's, there's a, a whole 
lot of dirt everywhere. Um, can you mitigate the risk of the dirt? Yes, you can by cleaning it. Uh, for each question, you need to be able to mitigate it. You need to get every area of risk. I think there are about 26 areas of risk uh, in the, the building's assessment is you need to get everyone to be green at the acceptable level. Um, if it's no, again, you move right, you go down and round to the prey box a different way. Um, if you can mitigate it, you can follow the yes down. If you do your uh, buildings assessment and everything is green, you simply go straight down to the next one, which is to ready the volunteers, to plan, to prepare and to protect. Uh, three areas there to, to ready the volunteers. Again, it's all in the notes, uh, what, you, which, what each one means uh, to plan, um, how you're going to use volunteers, where they're going to stand, what, who's going to do what, what the rotor is, to prepare people, perhaps a mini training session, uh, socially distanced, to protect, to get in uh, the masks and, and gloves, etc. Um, once you've done that, you can ready the building. Thinking about strategy, that's one-way systems, uh, signage uh, and sanitation, uh, guarding off different places that you don't want people to go at all, uh, etc. So the volunteers are ready, the building's ready. You send the documents uh, that are required to Chris Atherton. Again, Chris's details are in the notes that were sent out with the flowchart, um, as as are the the as is the list of de documents and things that you need to send to Chris. And, uh, and, and then you have to wait for Chris to get back to you uh, and you can open. Once you're open, you can pray. In fact, before you're open, you can pray. We can pray at any time and no doubt you've spent the last 12 weeks praying fervently for the reopening of the church and for all those in your community who are struggling at this time. Um, that is the box that we're aiming for. As I said, with all the no's is you coming down uh, the right hand side to explore new and different ways to pray and enable others to pray at home, walking past the chapel, um, online telephone, writing prayer letters. Judy's gonna talk to us about that later on. Uh, one final point before I hand over to, to Simon is uh, at the end of the first day, if you've reopened, have a think about how it's gone is there anything that we need to change? Perhaps the one-way system didn't work so well, um, whatever. But certainly at the end of every week, so that nothing ever slips and we stay within the regulations, is at the end of every week, evaluate, review and adjust. And that means just go back to the top of the flowchart. It's not gonna be as, as, as lengthy as the first time you do it, but just go through and, and say, you know, um, do, we, do we still want to open? We've done it for a week, do we want to continue? We've done it for a fortnight, do we want to continue? Is it working? Um, you don't need to inform Synod, you can go on to, to a, a personal risk assessment. So it may, you may find out that after a week, actually, um, half, your risk, half your workforce, your volunteer force, uh, are, are now gone up a risk and are no longer green and you've not got enough people. So you may, that may be a thing or something's happened in the building, whatever. But just at the end of every week, so that you continue to comply with the regulations, is evaluate, review and adjust what you've been doing. Okay, that was a quick run through. It's a bit like a roller coaster, so I said it would be, uh, but I hope it's been helpful. Uh, Simon and Chris are now going to um, take us through the risk assessments. Thank you, Jason. Can everybody hear me? Is that okay? Um, just had some problems with my microphone, so I'm hoping that you can hear me. Can Adrian nod for me if you can hear me? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for giving time tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about personal risk assessment and uh, I Jason on the um, program called it Workforce Risk Assessment because one of the things that uh, the Welsh Assembly Government is referring everybody to is the Workforce Risk Assessment which was first developed in the NHS. The URC noted that one and the way that it used scores to indicate people's risks um, but looked for one which included things that were more like 
the, the people that we're talking about, that we worship with, and things that gave scores into people who were 70 and 80 and so on. So on the front side of that, that sheet, it's, it's headed making choices about returning to church because assessing risk is about making choices. And it's about the impact that having COVID disease might have on you if you caught it. Because when you're thinking about risk, the thing is, you think about what's the harm, how likely it is to happen, and how serious it would be if it did happen. And so as the number of people with um, COVID-19 virus falls, it's less likely that you'll bump into somebody. But this personal risk assessment says, how serious would it be if you did? If somebody came to church and we became one of those places which, what, which they call a super spreader event, where through sitting in church with somebody for an hour, lots of different people got the virus. So this says, how serious would it be if you got it? It recognises that the government have, have put people into certain categories, like uh, people who are shielded. And we heard that in August that that's going to be paused. That was the announcement today to give people a bit more freedom. But what you don't hear in the headlines is the continuing restrictions. And we're still waiting for the guidelines that are going to be about churches reopening, which would include some kind of idea about who should attend and who should be more careful. But on the back side of this, the, the making choices sheet or the personal risk assessment is a kind of score sheet about how the different things that, that affect people might add up to create an overall impact from catching COVID. So for example, the people who wrote this, which were a group of medics said, compared to a woman in her fifties, how much more risky is it for a man? And when they looked at the numbers of all the people that had ended up in ITU or, or even died as a result of COVID, they found out that it was almost twice as likely for men to end up with a serious effect as it was for a woman. Um, it's four times as li likely for somebody over 60. It's 12 times as likely for somebody over 80. And so the way you fill this in is to put a circle around all that apply to you, whether you're a male, whether you've got diabetes, whether you're on treatments for, that suppress your immune system, and you add up the score at the bottom. And then if you're below three, you're in a low risk category. If you're between three and six, then you need to think about additional precautions. Um, are you going to wear a mask? Are you just, are you going to avoid crowded places? Are you going to make sure that you're always two meters apart? And then if you're over that, perhaps you really seriously need to consider whether it's worth the risk, worth the risk uh, of you catching COVID and how can you, how can you avoid that? And, and sometimes the best way of avoiding a risk is not to take it at all. So that's a quick overview of what this personal risk assessment does, it assesses the impact that catching COVID would have on you, talks about being sensitive to each other, about not putting pressure on each other, it talks about the different attitudes to risk, and it needs to be measured alongside the likelihood of catching something. And one of the reasons for making our buildings COVID secure is to reduce the likeliness, likelihood along with keeping hands washed and along with um, keeping the two meters distance. And talking to public health people today, what they're always talking about is creating a break from transmission. So how do you create a break? You know, you wash your hands, you use hand sanitizers, you try not to touch surfaces which might be contaminated and then touch your face or anything that could get virus from your hands into your eyes or your respiratory system. And it's all about making that break in transition. And sometimes that's about keeping people apart and keeping those who are most at risk away from risk. So that's a basic overview. If anybody's got any immediate questions on that, um, just for clarification, 
I'm happy to try and answer those now. Otherwise, we'll hand over to Chris for um, talking about the reducing likelihood in the buildings. Catherine, you need to unmute. Thank you, Jason. Um, one of the things that I've been talking to about elders is, is the difference between what we might do within our personal family circles and what we actually encourage people to do as responsible elders who are trustees. And they might not be the same. And I think we might have to be stricter in church than we are at home. Yeah, I think we need to be sensitive about this. Already in England, people are writing to the General Secretary saying they're trying to ban me from going to church. That's not what we're trying to do, but we are trying to keep people safe. Mm -hmm. And I think it's about seeing, seeing what we share as well. When we're in church, we share the same air. So it's not only what I'm prepared to put up with for myself, it's what my impact on the shared air is that's significant. No, it wasn't. It was um, particularly for us. It was because we have a cleaner who is over eighty, and we felt that it was irrespons not responsible to invite her to come back, even though she wants to to come back and clean, mm. because we are then asking her to put herself at risk. Um, and I'm not suggesting we ban anybody. It's up to people to make their own decisions. But there's there's, there's that sort of subtle difference really between what we encourage uh, people to do and what we. Uh, let them do themselves. Yes, if you look at the URC website today, you'll see that the URC is now strongly recommending that if people do return to church, everyone wears a face covering, a three layer face covering. Mm. So that. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Alison. Thank you. I, I can see a tension arising um, looking at the personal assessment that because we have churches with older people and quite a few who are over 80 that we're going to find it extremely difficult to mitigate um, the risk for them and that if we open where some people are going to be at more risk than others and um, you know for the over 80s even wearing masks and standing at a distance may not be enough I mean I suppose it's about the level of risk that we're willing to take to be inclusive because I think it's going to be very hard to open the church with all the 50 and 60 year olds and some of the 70 year olds maybe um, and younger but excluding the older people some of whom have been part of the church for so many years and this is their home so i can see that there's going to be a tension there i think that's right Alison, and that's why we're asking elders to consider fairly carefully about what's happening at the moment whether that's really second best because what we're really talking about is not getting people back into church services, but how we continue to glorify God, help people's faith to develop and serve the communities around us. And if we're doing that now, then we're, we're not failing. Um, and I think that inclusive question is going to be part of the dilemma about how we blend um, our continuing support for people either through resources on paper being sent to people or through through worship on platforms like this or by streaming services from church how we continue to include people who can only do so from home um, and how we handle that how we help them to still know that they're part of the fellowship of the spirit when we do move to to the next stage of um, either opening our buildings for private prayer or having services and uh, I think one of the things is that we had got used to um, before COVID we've got used to the kind of restrictions that stop people coming to church you know they 
they couldn't cope with the water tablets they were on and the length of the service or the hard dues or the stairs or whatever. And we got used to the kind of restrictions that imposed. Um, but now we've got new restrictions, additional restrictions, and, and how that's handled sensitively is going to be really important. I, I really value your comment, Alison. Thank you. Can I just say something before we move to Chris? Uh, just a couple of things following on from what Simon said, really, and, and Alison's question is, um, I think we need to, to see this time where we are now, not as a, a on-off button, not as we're, we were closed and now we're open. Uh, it's a transitional period uh, of, of, of moving uh, in a direction that could at any time move back again. We all know that we've heard of all the statistics and, and the things that happen so i think we, we need to bear that in mind and try and try and get that message pastorally across to our members um that, that you know this is a a, a move a, a transition period it's not a either open or either closed um we're, we're kind of somewhere in between uh, and the other thing before i hand over to chris who will no doubt have something to say about this um is uh, as elders um, you, you are tr trustees uh, uh, and therefore that responsibility that Catherine was saying about um, the difference between responsibility within your family but actually responsibility in this in, in, in the organization of the church uh, as elders uh, then um, I, I think that's a very different thing and I'll let Chris talk to that. Uh, Chris. Thank you Jason. Just one minute Kenneth. You'll need to unmute. Which you need to hold your space bar down. Right. There That's we are. It. Thank you. It's more of a comment than a question. We're a very small church. We have a congregation of about 20 or less. And an average age of about 75. And we have a, it's just a comment really, that we have a particular problem. And throughout the, the COVID epidemic, uh, quite a few of those people have actually been shielding, which now comes out in, in August the 16th. So we have a particular problem in volunteers to prepare the church. We have a particular problem in the preparation of the church for opening, because I have to say as well that the Lord, the age is very old. They are nevertheless, they're extremely keen to get back to church worship. Um, and maybe we have to uh, not only consider that very deeply, but we may need further discussion. On Thank you. Thanks, Ken. You're not alone in the Synod in being in a congregation of 20 or less. Uh, uh, three quarters of our churches are in that position. But we do recognise it. And that's why we're, we say a lot about not opening yet. Um, it may be that things will get worse in the autumn. It may be that they get better. We just don't know. But at the moment, it certainly seems risky for a congregation of 75 pluses to, to gather again. Um, it may not be safe yet. Jill? Um, we've got a bit of a problem. You've got all these wonderful risk assessments, but we haven't risk assessed how people get to the church. A lot of our, peop our people are actually brought to church and we can't do that anymore. I think that's a key point in the personal risk assessment and it's those kind of circumstances that you know about your own congregation um, and it's really important that that's taken into account in the conversations that happen yeah. um, and it, it, it is one of the gaps um, that's we encourage people to think about that in the personal risk assessment um, but it is one of the gaps between assessing the risks for the people coming and reducing the risks in the building which Chris will talk more about now. Um, you can just, you can do as much as you like reducing the risk in the building, but if people can't get there, it's a bit pointless. Yeah. Uh, I think the, 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 the issue there is, is it again, about areas of responsibility. 
um, and, and as elders, I'm talking specifically as elders acting on behalf of the church meeting, uh, which Chris will know much more than I do about this, but um, you, your responsibility is when they get to the church. Um, Chris. Thank you, Jason. Um, I think I will pick up where we've uh, where where we've just left off, um, and I think I need to to be very clear that we're not in, in the business of stopping anybody who might want to go to church to to go to church. Um, but there is a specific set of responsibilities that you have as elders and deacons, um, as trustees of the building, um, and they basically revolve around. You shouldn't be asking anybody to do something for you, or to volunteer for you, to clean or to um, act as a steward um, if they are in a if they are in a risk group or if they have an unfavourable personal risk assessment score. Your insurance company would expect you not to let them undertake those duties because the insurance company will be taking a very very cautious approach, and that's the cautious approach that you will need to adopt as you go through um, risk assessing for the building. Um, as I say, we are not want to stop anybody making their own personal decision, but when you're acting as elders and deacons, you're acting as trustees of the church, uh, and you need to think with um, a more distant hat on as to the consequences of the decisions. So um, I think generally, um, this will be the most important risk assessment you'll ever undertake. Uh, for those of you that love risk assessments, and I'm sure you're in the minority, there might only be me, um, but in essence this will be the most important one that you undertake. And you will need to complete all the sections, you can't leave out any of the sections, um, and red and orange scores are not acceptable um, if you can't mitigate them, you can't go any further. Um, so. The risk assessment that I think you've got in front of you um, has 40 points on it, some 16 sides, um, and is organised into a number of sections, preparing the building, social distancing, cleaning, public worship, and other church activities and external lettings. You've got another document which concentrates on the first three sections, um, where the, the points from the risk assessment are on the left hand side uh, and some comments that I put together are on the right hand side and those comments are in blue type. Is everybody with me so far? I'm tempted to say I'll take silence as it's okay but you've all been silenced so that doesn't work. So I think that the other general point to make is, is, is you shouldn't minimise the risk. Uh, one of the tendencies when you do risk assessments is to say the risk isn't as big as we think it is, so we we make the starting point smaller. Um, you should definitely not do that with this. So, so you really need to think about the level of risk that you are assigning to the various areas. Um, you, you've seen how uh, destructive this 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 virus is, um, and how indiscriminately. Um, it attacks people. So, so please don't minimise the risks. So um, we'll, we'll have a little quick tour through um, the risk assessment. Um, we'll start with looking at preparing the buildings. Um, so we've, we've sort of been mothballed for the last five months. Um, some of you might not have been in your buildings at all. Some of you may have popped in and out just to see what's going on. Um, but in essence there's going to be a lot of dust built up and all that sort of thing that will need to be got rid of potentially. Um, if you find that you have some mould that's growing out of your wood or your plaster that doesn't look very nice then you'll need to have that looked at by a specialist. Don't just assume um, that it is a build up of normal dust because it could be wet rot or dry rot. Um, if you haven't been going in and out of the building, <clears throat> that means you haven't been running the water. Um, it may well be that you will need to organise a Legionella test um, and you shouldn't be using the water until that takes place, even for cleaning, let alone for drinking or for the toilets. 
Um, we need to make sure that all your fire bits are in place, that, that, that your fire extinguishers have been tested and are up to date. If you have a fire system, that you have a log book and that, and that is up to date and the maintenance is up to date. Um, and you need to make sure that you have your electrical certificate uh, and your gas safety certificate. And, and um, we're collecting those at the moment. So if you haven't sent them to us, um, you'll need to send them to us as part of this process as well. I think um, the thing about cleaning is that you need to make sure if you're going to use a, a sanitizing cleaner that it's at least a level of 60% alcohol. Um, the ones under 60% alcohol don't do the job, uh, basically. So um, the other thing to think about is seating. Um, if you have fabric chairs, um, they're not so easy to clean, whereas wood and plastic is easy to clean. If you have those lovely cushions that people need, love, like to sit on, uh, they're all going into storage because they shouldn't be out. Um, you need to put them away because they're not easy to clean. Um, and this is your golden opportunity to declutter. Um, because I'm sure like most places, you have piles of things that have not seen the light of day for 20 or 30 years potentially. And this is your chance to declutter. Um, to turn your turn bookcases round so that the books can't be used and that sort of thing. Clear the tops of surfaces so that they're easy to clean and all that sort of thing. Um, and to have a real good, do I really need it? No. So you, there's your golden opportunity to, to do that. Um, obviously, you need to think about um, as you how you order the building to move people around the building. Um, and as part of that, you need to think about signage uh, and you need to think about visual impairment when you think about signage, having uh, the right sort of font size and, and the type of font so that it makes it easier, uh, easier to read. Um, we have talked about um, personal risk assessment, um, but we need to think about the provision of PPE. Um, you've heard Simon already say that the URC uh, is strongly recommending the use of uh, face coverings um, and, and I think potentially the position here in Wales may change by the time we get to the stage of, of, of opening potentially about that. Um, and it, you need to make sure that, that um, as you choose to get rid of your rubbish once you are open um, you need to double bag that rubbish and it needs to be left for 72 hours before it goes in uh, to the normal bins to, to, to be taken away. Um, you're going to need to think about your safeguarding policy, um, in particular how it, it, it will deal with um, vulnerable adults that may come on their own or vulnerable adults that may come with carers, um, and also how you might deal with um, unaccompanied young people as well, who may be teenagers who would potentially be old enough to come church. Um, then, then we need to, to, to think a little bit about cleaning, uh, how, how you might uh, use, how you might clean the building uh, um, and obviously um, potentially you may want to organize a deep clean uh, to start with. Uh, you may choose to bring somebody in to do that deep clean for you, particularly if you're short of, uh, of volunteers who could safely do that that sort of thing and that would be um, a perfectly acceptable way way forward uh, but going forward you'll need to make sure that, that that things are cleaned so if somebody if you are opening for private prayer for instance and somebody comes in and sits on a seat um, either that seat's got to be cleaned as after that person leaves or that seat's taken out of circulation until everything is cleaned at the end of the session so there's things like that if you're going to use toilets um, and the ones that have gone through the process so far have decided not to use toilets. But if you are going to use toilets, then you're going to be asking people to clean the seats and the handles and the taps after they've used it. And periodically, you're going to be going to clean it yourself to, to ensure that it is, it is, all, it is all done. Um, the other thing to ensure, Simon's mentioned airflow, uh, because we're breathing the same air. Uh, and it is important to have airflow through the building. Now, for lots of our buildings, our windows don't open very well. Um, 
So it may be the doors that, that you'll need to, to keep open to, to ensure an airflow, but that has to be done safely because there's also security um, aspects uh, about that. Um, and then I think about the social distancing arrangements, um, you need to think about a route through your building. You need to think about what areas you don't want people in, how you're going to get people in, how you're going to get people out, um, how there are no pinch points at all, no congestion points, um, how you're going to deal with people who may be queuing to come into you, so they're going to have to be two metres apart while they're queuing, and while they're in the building at private prayer, they have to be two metres apart as well, either individually or in, in household groups. Um, uh, and as it stands at the moment in Wales, the arrangements for bubbles haven't changed. Uh, so households are still very small. Um, that's not quite the same in England, but in Wales, they haven't changed. Um, I think the only other thing I, I think I want to say is, is about external lettings, which is in the, in, in the other setting, other parts of the risk assessment. Um, if you have people who are using the building and, and they are able to come back to use the building when you open because their activity is being allowed by the Welsh Government, um, then they're going to need to undertake their own risk assessment and they're going to have to produce that to you so that you can see that they can operate safely, uh, maintaining social distancing. Um, and there shouldn't be anything in that that contravenes your own risk assessment. Um, your risk assessment has primacies, theirs doesn't. Um, so I will give you the example of a keep fit class. They might have 40 in the hall. Um, under social distancing, they may only better have 10. Um, which may mean they choose not to come back. But, but that's what um, we have to think about, because at the moment, um, the two metre rule in Wales remains enshrined in legislation uh, and has not been amended. Um, there has been talk of exceptions, but they have not been specified so far. Um, I think I've said enough, uh, Jason. I'll, I'm happy to take any quick questions if there are any. Catherine? Um, I think this is a misprint. Under your social distancing, this, this one with your comments in blue, Chris, Yeah. there's a not missing, I think. Because at the moment it says, whilst accepting that stewards will be briefed, they should put themselves at risk with people who will not socially distance. Uh, yeah. Yes, there should be a not there. I know, but I mean, I think, I think it's worth saying because some people Take this, take this as gospel. <laughs> Thank you. Both spotted. <laughs> Any other questions at this point? Carol. Uh, in the event that you have uh, an external group in your church, who is responsible for the sterilization of equipment, etc. After their use, is that down to the trustees of the church? Well, I would be arguing that that, that their risk assessment should cover how they're going to leave the building as they find it. Right. So you, you would expect them to leave it as they find it. You would expect them also then to be uh, sterilized if they use toilets or if they use doors and things to yes. sterilize as they go out. Yes. Right. I don't think that's unreasonable. Right. Um, at, the moment, at the moment, I think you all need to realise that no external groups have permission to use buildings. No. Um, we're only talking about church being open for private prayer, and potentially the next step is that church would be open for public worship. Okay. That would not include external activities. Pamela, did you have your hand up? No, I didn't for that. I'll, I'll ask at the end because it's past now. Yeah. Um, I can't see any other hands up at this point. So I'm going to ask Chris to talk. Oh, yeah, Alison. Alison, Joe and Donna. So Joe's unmuted now if Joe wants to speak. Joe Jones. And then, yeah. and then Donna. 
Um, I'm conscious that we've mentioned quite a lot of things where we've said you'll need to get somebody in to do that or you may want to commission somebody to do your deep clean. I wonder whether anybody has any realistic idea of how likely it is that if there are churches all over the country trying to get people in to do these things, we're going to be able to get it done in the time scales we might like to anyway. There's going to be a big queue, I think, for some things. Okay, so the only thing that I'm aware of that is in short supply at the moment, if I use that phrase, is there's quite a waiting list for Legionella inspections. Okay. Um, but that does depend on how many in your area um, are actually uh, appropriately qualified to carry out those inspections. Um, those people that have been wanting to book deep cleans haven't found it difficult to do so. Okay, that's that's useful. Thank you. Seems to be significant cleaning capacity, uh, and it may be that you can uh, achieve the same effect by running the water for twenty minutes. But uh, it depends whether you're building how long it is since your building's been used yeah. and so on. So it's it's worth finding out about that. I think Alison was next, and then Donna. Thank you. Um, when you're assessing the level of risk. I'm just playing it over in my mind. So we're, we're looking at all the different areas and what's risky and what isn't and what is acceptable and not. Do, does everything have to be very low risk? Because I'm, I'm thinking if you've got volunteers, for example, most of your volunteers are in their 70s, for example, then they are personally in the middle the middle group of risk, aren't they? They're not the, the low risk, they are the, the uh, vulnerable, uh, clinically vulnerable, not the most vulnerable who are the eight in their 80s. So we can mitigate against it, you know, we can wear the, the, the equipment and keep the distancing. So the question really is, um, what is the level of risk that is acceptable or, or does each church decide for itself what they're prepared to um, determine as the level of risk? If that's clear enough. Okay, Alison. Um, and, uh, Jason touched on this uh, at the beginning and Simon has as well. Um, you should be aiming for the green, which is the, which is the acceptable box with mitigation. Um, if you happen to start out in the first place and you're in green, well, that's very good. Um, yeah. But you should be using, you should be aiming for the for the green box with mitigation. Um, and if you look at the keys on the on the risk assessment, yeah, um, effectively green is what only one you can have, right? With, with any safety, because okay. when you get to yellow, that is undesirable. Okay. Now your insurance company is likely to take a very dim view of you doing anything that is undesirable. All right. Okay. Um, All right. So it's just, quite a high it, bar, isn't it? It's quite a high bar. Is, I'm afraid it is a high bar. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, and it's a high bar because we're having to take this cautious approach. Yes. Um, I understand. Uh, to it. Uh, I'm not saying that, that, that your model of, of, of your volunteers and having your volunteers with the appropriate PPE is, is unacceptable or, or even undesirable. Um, you'd have to work out in your own mind, uh, along with everything else, how you chose to organise the building to give you additional mitigation as to whether that was going to be acceptable. Okay. Um, now there may be some buildings that are very, very tight and that even with somebody wearing a mask and gloves, etc., that the, the, actually the social distancing is well under two metres and that isn't acceptable. Um, you'd be putting somebody at, at a higher risk. Um, we may have a building like, like it's a big barn and there's loads of space. Mm. Um, that's why it's an individual um, assessment by the elders and deacons so that their own circumstances of their own building yeah. are thought about. Thank you. Thank you. Donna, next. Yeah. 
Hi. Um, okay, so um, we actually share a church building with the church in Wales, and they are planning on opening for private prayer this weekend. But would you expect us to submit their risk assessment in addition to ours, or just absorb it into our own risk assessment? Okay, so who owns the building? They do. Okay, so, so you will need to follow their risk assessment model. Right. Uh, because their risk, so, so we, 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 we're taking the same route as we take for safeguarding, but whoever owns the building, the congregation is expected to follow that trustee's procedures. So, so you would need to follow the Church in Wales risk assessment and you would submit that. Right, okay. You may, you may add to it, Yes. To respect your situation, but the model you'd submit to me would be the Church in Wales one. Right. Okay. Catherine. Can I ask about meetings outside? What are the guidelines for those at the moment? Guidelines for those at the moment are that you need the organisers need to have control of the space, mm -hmm. so they need to be able to. Um, stop people coming and they need to be able to brief people that when they come what behavior is expected and that they need to keep social distance and there can be no more than 30 people 30 individuals in an organized act of worship outside that, that's what the regulation but that's what the guidance will be when it comes out in the next couple of days Okay. Uh, I mean, a specific question is, it's been suggested we could have an elders meeting in somebody's garden, but I suspect that's not acceptable because there's different rules for private gardens, isn't it? You can only have two households. Correct. So, so, so the, but, the, but, but potentially you could have a meeting in the park. Yeah. Okay. Because you yeah, yes, we want everybody to listen to us shouting at each other from six feet apart. Yeah, I think that, that there's a question there about confidentiality as well. <laughs> I, I, I think the, what, what, what the, the government people have said so far is they accept that people may need to be in the building to prepare the building. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore you may feel that it's legitimate to have a socially distanced elders meeting in the building before you start but depending on the age and the mix of the elders you might want to do a risk assessment on that before you actually do it just to check that you're not putting them at a risk to actually have the meeting to decide you're not going to take the risk if you see what I mean um, so um, there may need to be some shuttle diplomacy on the phone before you actually gather mm. okay can we have Carol's question and this will be the last one for the minute um, before we just move on there'll be another question time uh, in a little while Carol in the event that we have, um, we do have meetings and we're, we're, we're coming into church, in the event that a stranger walks in, uh, do we have to track and trace, take their details? And we would have the details of our members and presumably we would register the fact that certain members were in certain meetings or services. But if, mem if are we expected to track and trace? So there will be an expectation that you track and trace. No, there will no, be. Well, the guidance will say the guidance will say that provided people stay two meters apart, you don't need to register their details. But if people go closer than one meter than two meters, then you need to take their name and address right. uh, right. or contact details. Okay. So uh, that's that's a question for you in your building about whether you can confidently say that people will always be two metres apart. The regulation, the, the guidance rather, will say that you don't need to register provided that, but if people are going to get closer than that because um, going through the doors or the vestibule, it's not possible, um, then then you'll need to register for track. You'll need to keep people's contact details for track and trace. Judy, are you answering? No, I'm, I'm, I'm answering something that Chris mentioned. Actually, uh, so Chris mentioned about unaccompanied uh, eighteen-year-olds or my under eighteen-year-olds, um, and there is guidance that has been produced by Children and Youth Work uh, Department uh, today, 
and the the guidance for the uh, unaccompanied minors is that uh, we encourage churches to um, plan a, if you think you're going to have under 18s attending anything that you're doing in church that you should um, plan a, and risk assess the response in advance of that occurrence so having appoint a person through safe recruitment to act in local parentis with them having a personal risk assessment in place and a way of collecting for track information for track and trace so um, that's the kind of guidance for under 18s that may attend um, not many of our churches will have that grouping of people but uh, it's just for your information really Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, three minutes break to stand up, turn around, sit down again. Um, and uh, I'll see you back here at um, 8.36, precisely. Okie doke, we're uh, at 8.36. Um, I hope you're all refreshed after that long break. And uh, we're gonna hand over to Judy, who's going to guide us through the most important box in the process. <laughs> um, this is the box that we can all do, which is quite nice. Um, so uh, in the newsletter last or this month, uh, there was uh, uh, ideas for praying outside of your church. I would encourage you to go and look at that. But there are lots of other ways that we can actually pray. Um, in a safe way outside of our building. If you have a, a space, an outside space in your building, it may be that you create a labyrinth um, for people to, to walk. Um, that can be used either in a, um, using leaves and twigs and it, and it can be uh, changed on a regular basis or you can use marking uh, spray paint that the Footballers use um, on the grass. I don't know what it's called. It's got a technical name, I'm sure. Um, so that would be one thing. But we also have talked about outdoor worship. Um, and if there is a, like I live five minutes from the beach and our beach services have always happened. If you can, as Simon said, uh, control that space, there isn't anything to stop you having outdoor worship in a park, in a, on a beach, uh, for 30 people. And if, as long as you can um, secure that space and follow the guide, guidance that the government are setting. But there are also ways of worshipping, which is just using your senses. So encouraging people to do a prayer walk around their community, um, praying for the streets in your community, um, thinking, having, having a thought about being, looking and listening, using our senses to experience God closer to us as we're praying. And, and maybe having a sign outside your church to say, we're encouraging you to do that. Catching a piece of a leaf or a flower that reflects somebody who you want to hold in prayer. So there are ways of us praying. Prayer trails might be a way to uh, pray outside your building by setting up, um, I'm not very keen on laminated sheets, but um, setting up laminated sheets with a beginning, um, a station on forgiveness, a station about intercessions or uh, thanksgiving, and then a, a final space where you might uh, put a cross or something for um, uh people to uh, pray around at the end. There might also be prayer stations that you can set up around your church. Um, things, there was a, a church in Scotland uh, that actually has set up prayer stations around their church and on each prayer station they have put think, act and pray. So thinking is, is a, something to ponder, a Bible verse is something for you to think about. The act is a call to action, something that you can do for yourself that uh, responds to that thought and then a prayer at the end. And you can set them up quite easily again around your, um, your building or around your community if you wanted. 
there was a thought at one point, and I have heard of churches doing this, of setting up uh, laminated sheets on benches. I would say that I'm not quite sure what the guidance is. The guidance was that you made, had to not use, not sit too long on a bench, but I'm not sure what the guidance is now. I haven't um, gathered any of that information, but I would say highlight to people that they have should use hand sanitizer after they've been sitting on a public bench as well. So there are lots of different ways, and I don't think we should ever shy away from the options of praying. Um, and I would again highlight the the, the small th small acts of prayer that we can do as a community and encourage our churches to be acting actively praying in your community. Um, and um, so please do look at the the document that's on the newsletter this week. And if you haven't had it, then I certainly can send it. And I'm going to type up these other outdoor suggestions and they will be put on our website so that you can access them on on the website as well. Um, so I think what we all need to do really is just to get out there and pray. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, OK, so we've got some time now for, for questions. Um, just while you're thinking about what questions you want to ask, Chris, do you want to just say something about documents that are going to need to be sent to Synod? What do you? Um, yes, just just very quickly, um, you will need to to to, to send to me um, the risk assessment, um, a plan of your church and how you are proposing to socially distance, etc. Your cleaning protocols uh, and also your safeguarding policy. Um, if we aren't holding your electrical and gas safety certificates, um, we will need those as well. Can I just say one other thing, Jason, very quickly before I have people think about questions, uh, and that's just a little bit about track and trace. Um, the guidance may be saying that, that you don't have to keep a list if you are keeping two metres apart. Um, I suspect that will not be what your insurance company will be expecting you to do. I think your insurance company will be expecting you to keep a list every time you are open and keep that list for 21 days. And certainly the regulations will require to, you to keep a list of staff. Um, so those volunteers that were, were involved in opening up and organising the space, they'll want a list of that kept for 21 days. It'll be fairly well set out in the regulations, but I think Chris is right in terms of the um, the insurers com insurance company might want uh, an extra extra buffer should um, should something happen so that people can be easily contacted. I think we all heard about the pub that um, ended up ringing around 90 people um, in the south southwest, um, and uh, we don't want to be trying to remember who they were when we're involved in that. Thank you. Pat, you've got a question. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it was more a, a comment actually just on, on the back of Judy's uh, observations. Um, something I had suggested to me the other day, which I thought was a brilliant idea in the context of sort of prayer stations and that kind of thing, um, is that as become people become more techno-literate, um, rather than having to have laminated things up everywhere um qr codes are becoming much more common most people are carrying phones around with them that can read qr codes so it's just it's a it's a much neater way of um we we were talking about the possibility of prayer stations in in our church garden that would actually only need you know in each location a qr code uh, uh yes actually on the um the document I put on the newsletter that is a virtual QR code um, thing on there and what I what I suggested was that you set up a padlet with a prayer wall on your padlet you could write uh, type in your prayer wall your prayer onto the tablet uh, the padlet um, app and you, you QR, QR code took you directly to that so yes uh, that's definitely a, a, a good way of um, you're looking at technology and um, using the technology and the various apps that are around there. Yeah. 
What's a Padlet? It's is, so, it, is it Padlet. just me that don't know that? Padlet is a is a app which you can uh, use, and it's a bit like notes. And I know that some of our churches are using it quite a lot and have been using it quite a lot um, to communicate things. I think Canton have been using it to pass information around and things. So yeah, it's it's kind of like a notepad, literally, literally a notepad yeah. Padlet thing. Jason, Pamela's got a hand raised. I'm just trying to say Pamela, but my space bar's <laughs> given up. Yeah, um, you've got it now. Okay, um, two things. One was um, in terms of the volunteer uh, risk assessment in terms of their health. This is something that they do personally, is it? And just give the score, because obviously it's very personal information and sensitive information that's on this sheet. Yeah, what was suggested is that they do it and it forms the basis of a conversation. So perhaps with their pastoral elder, um, with the minister, if you've got one, or maybe if they're really concerned that they talk it over with their GP, we're not asking people to send those risk assessments in. Um, that's to help people think through the choice. We are, um, it's, it's partly because of the shared responsibilities about buildings. That's the reason we're asking that, that the, tr the elders are the trustees for the local activity and the local funds. Um, a building will have other trustees and those trustees need to be consulted. All of the trustees need to be consulted. And in lots of places, that's the uh, URC Trust Company Limited. And that's why we're asking for those documents to be shared via Chris. Um, but also for our a corporate responsibility as a church, but we're not expecting you to, to send back a sheaf of personal risk assessments with mm -hmm. that um, that people have filled in. Um, but it's it's the start of the conversation. It's a it's a personal thing, but it's it can be the start of the conversation if people are worried. Thank you. I was just going to make a comment. Um, I think it was Joe that was talking about cleaning firms. A lot of cleaning firms have been working throughout COVID, so therefore meet the deep clean criteria because they know what they're doing but not so much in the experience of my church but in my experiences work it's worth you shopping around because um, they can command now um, you know whatever they like because they're needed and so I've you know, I think it's a good idea just to ring a few and get prices rather than taking the first one. But I don't think there'll be an issue in terms of accessibility because cleaning firms have been working throughout COVID are now used to exact, knowing exactly what is required. Thank you, Pamela. Any other questions? Uh, Brad. Thank you, Jason. Mentioned earlier on with regards to cleaning the problems uh, associated with fabric chairs. What's the current recommendation for fabric chairs and cleaning that will debug them, so to speak? Any ideas? The government regulations say anything upholstery, anything hard services need to be steam cleaned. I'm not sure how practical that is for churches. That's in um, whenever they give. Um, cleaning, what they do is they reference to cleaning for non-healthcare environments and that's what it says under, under, that, um, under that guidance. So if you Google um, cleaning COVID non-healthcare environments, that will, that will show up. What they're particularly concerned about is where people put their hands down to help themselves up. Um, so if you're... It, you've got to assess where people are most likely to touch because it's not where your bum is, it's where your hands would be. Um, I, and that, so think that through, you know, and if you've got hard chairs on site, it might be worth swapping some of the cloth covered ones for, for some of the hard ones. I think that's what Chris was saying, they're easier to clean. The vast majority of fabric chairs will have a metal frame which holds the legs. 
and that's generally what people will be touching. That's cleanable, but there will be byproducts on the fabric alongside that. Carol, and then Janet, and then Catherine, and then Mo. Carol. Regarding the, chair, regarding the chairs, you can actually buy uh, disposable plastic chair covers that obviously you would have to dispose of uh, properly afterwards. And the other thing is, as the other gentleman said, you can actually leave, just leave. If nobody is going to be using your building for 72 hours, you can just leave them for 72 hours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, Janet. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask about um, having an outdoor meeting at a person's house where I had understood that that wasn't allowed. Can the elders not meet at, in someone's garden? Nope. The, the bubble arrangements haven't changed within Wales. You're only allowed to bubble with one other household. I see. But we could meet in a park. Yeah. Yes, if you were happy um, with the confidentiality. I think that there's two things here. There's, there's the, what you can do, what you're allowed, what, the point they're always trying to get across is the more people you have together, the greater the risk. So whatever you do needs to be socially distanced. You need to be two meters apart whatever you do so if you can't meet in a place where you can't be two meters apart then that's that's difficult it's better to try and do it over a format like this um, now being inside is riskier than being outside and currently what the the regulations say is that you can do some things um that are, are voluntary um the general just meeting, you're not allowed to, meet, to gather just for no reason. You need a reasonable reason to gather. Um, and so the, I think that's, that's the area that we're playing with and the, the, um, the regulations aren't totally consistent. But what, what, Chris, what, what they always say what the, the public health people always say when this question is asked is, can't you do it another way? Well, this is it. We were thinking of having an elders meeting in, in a garden. Is, is that not possible? No. No, it's not. Because the, the regulations are very clear that house only in, in households, only two households may come together. But, but it is clear that you can hold an act of work, that you'll be able to hold an act of worship outside if you control the space that can be up to 30 individuals. And that's where, that's where the, um, the interplay of the, mm. of, of what you're allowed to do as private citizens and what you're allowed to do for, as they release particular things to happen. Um, and we keep asking them about governance meetings. Um, but they keep focusing on, on worship um, uh, as, as the thing that they're allowing. Thank you. Um, just two last questions. Um, it'd be Catherine and then Mo. Just to say, if you have got any other questions, uh, you know, you can always, uh, A, look at the briefing uh, that comes out um, every month, but also you could email or contact uh, one of the Synod officers. Uh, Catherine. I was I was going to speak about chairs, but somebody said that already. You can just leave them for seventy two hours. But okay. um, I was just going to say, if we can, I feel obliged to say, can we mitigate the use of disposable plastic? Yeah. We we are going towards being an eco synod. Some of us are eco churches, and the rise in single use plastics over this period has been phenomenal. And I think if we can try to avoid it as much as possible, it would be good. Yeah, thank you for that point. Mo, you need to unmute. Uh, 
um, it was only just to underline, because we have a, a scientist in our congregation um, who has re reiterated over and over this issue of the 72 hours, because for a lot of our churches, we meet on one Sunday, and then for good or ill, we perhaps only meet again on the next Sunday. And that actually is a massive help in mm. terms of controlling things. And people need to really, really grasp this, that the virus doesn't exist forever and ever in a day. And um, your cloth chairs and all these other things, if, for example, you are only meeting Sunday morning by Sunday morning, if, let's, uh, most of us probably do have some groups that use the building or used to, but if you're just meeting Sunday by Sunday, in a well for us in a, a fairly small congregation in a quite a large church with pews roped off so that they have to sit at social distance blah 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 and they keep their hymn books and that that is actually a huge safeguarding factor for people that's all it, it's it's trying to look at the positives of of how we move forward and and thank you to uh, i think it was judy who talked about those uh prayer stations around the church that's something I have to say, our, our church, I hadn't thought of it, and they will just love, because they will design in them and put them up. And there's been lots of really helpful thoughts today about how we can move forward, keeping it slightly more positive. I know we have to be careful. I know, because most of our congregations are very elderly, but to keep that sort of positive sense of moving forward and beginning to open up and giving people a sense of hope and we're going to come back, you know, we've got a plan. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. That's uh, uh, excellent. I, and, and just that, I want to reiterate that the positivity, that's where the, the flow chart says, you know, if you go to the right and say, no, we're not reopening at this time, that's not a failure. It's a different way to pray, to worship, uh, to, to connect uh, in, in fellowship, as many have been doing. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, one is, I want to say, uh, I understand, I mean, I completely understand the, the desire to open and to get back together and to worship. I'm missing it immensely. Uh, but but the risk assessments and the rules and that, um, sometimes we, we can see them as things to get round or get through or get over like hoops. But, you know, you don't need me to tell you that this is this is about staying safe and keeping people safe. And and if, if I had to be overcautious to save you know, a member of a church's life, then I'd be overcautious. Um, so, you know, see it that way rather than, uh, and, and, and see it as a progression. We're on a journey of opening uh, and hopefully uh, back to, uh, or back to the future. Um, I want to end with a, a, a word from uh, the Bible, uh, from Philippians chapter four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. God of joy, God of healing, God of presence and peace, be with the members of all our congregations may those who live alone know your presence with them this night may those who are suffering be healed and those who are anxious feel that peace which surpasses all understanding bless us that we might be a blessing to everyone else Guide us, guard us, and protect us, O Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. We'll share the grace together. It helps, I've found, on Zoom if you stay muted as we do this.
then we're not all over the place, but we're still doing it together. Okay? All right, Catherine? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, do remember that there's a session on Saturday morning um, about generally about reopening. Um, we may mention risk assessments, but you've probably had enough of them all, to, all, all together. Um, is, is, it's a generally a discussion about uh, the reopening process going forward. So uh, see you there, hopefully. All right, good night and God bless. Thank, Thank you. you.